Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Midlothian Safer Communities uh, Reducing Reoffending Board. Um, I hope there is no objection to me assuming the, the convener of this board today until we do elect a new one at a future date. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, thank you. Are there any apologies? It's George Wilson from the MVA, Chair. Any other apologies? Okay. Order of business. Yeah, it's published here. Okay. Any declaration of interest can be made at any point during the meeting. Uh, we have uh, a bit of governance to go through the minutes of the meeting of the Midlothian Safer Communities Board of the 18th of August 2015. That's for approval. Members present, could they I'm happy to approve? Okay, thank you. We move to eight. Are we staying in the order of the, the police report and then the, the, the <laughs> short term to get up for, back first this time? Okay. Uh, item number five, uh, scrutiny report uh, the, from the 1st of April to the 30th of September 2015. Thank you. Any questions or comments to the Chief Superintendent for her remarks at the moment? Councillor Devink. Uh, it's my understanding, of course, that the, the third that was said we're going to leave would be within a five year period, isn't it? It's not, they, were, they weren't just thinking of leaving right now. I mean, <laughs> I would think of leaving the Council in five years' time, but. That's not an immediate. Is there a concern that, that, that people would be uh, wanted to leave sooner than that? Yes, I was at the community council last night as well, and uh, two police officers assured us that that was the local aspect was going to come in again. So, Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Chair. It's always very difficult to uh, interpret. Um, questionnaires, staff questionnaires, because I think that certainly when I worked at the Royal Bank, if you ask people, you'd probably find at least a third wanted to leave. And uh, certainly in the teaching profession, uh, in social care, nursing, there are a lot of people, because it's largely due to the stress, I think. Um, and also, as you say, um, if there are changes like, for example, changes to pensions, etc., if I were filling in a form and I wanted to apply pressure to those who are making these decisions, I would say I'm thinking of leaving to try to, to, to strengthen that case. I think the question I would like to ask is, with regard to that is what have the trends been? How, you know, people who are actually leaving, have they been going up uh, significantly over the, the, the past year or two? Uh, because if they have, then I would certainly worry about this. Okay. Right, Chief Inspector Simpson. No, just to say that um, we now have a pilot running um, where the um, community care team leader that's on duty goes down to the public protection team in Brunton Hall twice a week and goes through all the referrals that are coming through in relation to uh, adult protection, which is, and health is also part of that crucially, which means that for the first time police can directly 
refer on um, these concerns to health, whereas before there wasn't any route for them to do that and everything had to come through social work. So as a result of that, the number of adult concern forms that are actually hitting Fairfield House is significantly reduced, like I think it's 40, 50 per cent reduced. Um, so I would imagine that although we might have to tweak how this is done, it's taken up quite a lot of staff time, the results are so worth it that we will probably continue with this in some shape or form. There's a meeting about it in early December to look at how to take it forward, but it's been very successful. Okay, there's a lot in that report. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I appreciate the difficulty when you're looking at figures like this, that, as you say, that many of these uh, crimes, it's very, very difficult to see how you could improve <laughs> what, what you do. And one particular, well, I'm just going to ask a question first on the domestic abuse. I've noticed that um, when, when you say the detection rate, when you talk about the detection rate there, I presume the problem for you is lack of evidence because it's not a crime where it's difficult to find out who the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator is. So again, you know, it's something which would be very difficult for you to, to improve on. Uh, however, on the same subject, I noticed that uh, it says on, on page 13, it says, ensure 95% of domestic abuse bail checks are conducted within 24 hours. Now, why isn't that 100%? Because this is an important crime to, to, to tackle and you know we should be prepared we know who's coming out on on bail or whatever and we should be able to make that 100 percent and that uh, i'd like to ask uh, about that uh, next question i have on page 17 refer to the handheld radar equipment the speed guns which i'm, I'm quite glad to see being, being introduced more and more my question it really is are these uh, are those who who hold them concealed or are they high vis because i think that makes makes a huge huge difference uh, my final question is on uh, page, uh, pages 23-24 about the house breaking. Uh, uh, this is one that worries me because I know certainly from people who contact me in the ward that it's, even though it's obviously not serious as attempted murder or, or, or crimes where people get injured or killed, it's one which is very visible. Word gets round, somebody was trying to break into a house and, and when that goes up, we know about it, and as you, as you obviously do. Uh, I've noticed the statistics are showing that an increase in, in crimes committed, but also an increase in uh, detection. Now, I'm aware from the, your officers who come to the community councils that there is a lag between uh, what crimes that are solved relate to ones which are perhaps in a previous period. So if we're seeing an increase in the, uh, the level of crime, particular crime, and also, but if we're also seeing the same percentage being resolved, that would reflect an increase in, if you, if you like, the, the previous, or it would, it would look like it was a decrease, I think, because you'd be re relating an increased number of crimes being solved against uh, a, a changing number which uh, are on your books, if you like, because you'd be, in that particular case, you'd have a smaller number to resolve than you've got now. So I'm just wondering if that's the reason why the figures are looking like that, or whether um, you know, you, you, you are improving your, your actual detection rate, if that didn't confuse you. Councillor Parry. Uh, thanks, Chair, um, and thanks for the report as well. I do you think it's uh, really insightful? One thing that I did want to ask about, and it's more about what's not here uh, rather than, than what's here, and was about how you uh, track uh, economic crime, if you like. Uh, I'm just very aware that as we uh, move into a period where uh, people might not have the same financial stability, that sometimes the temptation to kind of uh, turn to smaller crimes like shoplifting and, and petty thefts can increase and that there can be a causation there. But I just wondered what work you're doing to track that, whether you're seeing any trends um, and whether you're doing analysis on things like gender split and such like as well. Councillor De Wink. Peter, that's, that's for the procurator fiscal, that's not for the, the police. The, the police will take them to the court or, or press the charges, but the procurator fiscal is the one who prosecutes it in the court. Yeah, no, I accept that. I accept so that's maybe not for this, uh, this body here this morning. This is, uh, again, for the courts, Peter. It's not for the, the, the police. Please pursue... Right. 
think you'll find the private prosecutions are not in Scotland, but anyway. Councillor Parry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, just uh, one quick point I wanted to pick up on <clears throat> um, the Priority 5, which is that social behaviour and uh, detection out for hate crime. Um, there's a point about what are you doing promoting the use of remote uh, reporting. Um, I just wondered how many uh, remote reporting sites that we've have we have we got any in Midlothian and is there any in schools? Um, it's something that I've worked with previously before. And I know how valuable it can be. So, I just wondered if you had more information. Mr. King, Chairman, not really a question for Police Scotland, but with the road safety stats as we have and with a large number of soldiers currently deployed from the local battalion, I'd like to place on public record uh, the thanks to the Council for the support with the crossing warden at the Bellswood, Morriswood area, and also to say that we, as a garrison headquarters, look forward to eventually being able to utilise the uh, Community Covenant Grant Fund to improve the road safety in that area. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a comments, as I think um, said before in this, that I'm uh, totally in favour of stop and search, and it may very well have uh, worked in Aberdeen. Uh, we'll never know now, and I just hope that the people that are uh, condemning the, the stop and search policies that went on, uh, would then end up with more young people uh, lying in a gutter somewhere. There are two other points I would like to raise. It's in the, the drug dealing and um, supply. I had a, a, a constituent approach me a few weeks ago, and she said that uh, she had supplied the police with names and addresses uh, of people round about her who were uh, dealing in drugs, and their clients were then their paraphernalia was end up in her garden. She couldn't let her child go out to play. Uh, they were urinating and using the, the back garden as a toilet. Um, can you comment on these, uh, these incidents when, when names and addresses are supplied to the police and she sees no action happening? Is it, is it, what's the process for uh, when that happens? I, I would like to see two burly policemen chapping their doors the next again day just to let the, the person that's trying to help the police uh, see that some action is being taken. And on the breaking uh, side, uh, I heard a disturbing story, and I'm hoping it is definitely... Uh, not true, and it's um, just somebody's uh, imagination running right that uh, a woman in a house, an S bank on her own with two young children, uh, heard people uh, trying to enter her house. They were trying to remove the window, apparently. Uh, she dialed 999, uh, was given no response. She then had to retreat to her bedroom and hide under the bed with the two children, um, putting her hand over her mouth so they couldn't be heard and the people took away our television. And the police didn't respond till the next again day. Please tell me that's, um, that's not true. That's all I'd uh, like to know on that one. As I said, it would horrify me if that had actually happened. Anyway, thank you for uh, uh, the, the police report. Uh, we now move on to item number seven, I think it is. Six. Six. Okay. It's <laughs> getting your tea time. Any comments or questions? Okay, thank you. I'm going to move to item number seven um, uh, from the fire service. Okay, thank you, Chair. Members, um, I'll hand over to Dean shortly to um, provide the quarterly report. Just before we do that, I'd like to touch on some developments in the provision of control rooms um, that will affect Midlothian. When the fire service reformed in 2013, we had eight legacy services. Each service had its own control room. We went through a process of analysing the control rooms we had, rationalising resources, through the board process, we decided to have three control rooms in Scotland, one in Johnson and Strathclyde, one in Dundee for the north, and one in Tollcross for the east. 
Now, in, in the East, we had three services. We had a control room in Thornton, a control room in Madison, and a control room in Toll Cross. We're going through the process of amalgamating the three control rooms in the East. Um, quite far on in that, indeed, we've refurbished the control room in Toll Cross. And on the 23rd of November, our control room staff will start to move into that control room from the Edinburgh control room. And then on the end of July, uh, sorry, the end of January, 26th of January, staff from Madison will start to move into the control room in Toll Cross. And then at the end of the first quarter next year, we should have the staff from Thornton coming into that control as well. So it's just a, really an update for yourselves. There will be that change in provision. Okay. Questions or comments? Um, okay. Dean. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'll um, be as concise as I can be with the report and um, take any questions at any time that anyone has. Um, we'll start on page four of the report uh, with the performance summary at the top. Um, you'll see from the six areas that we report on that um, four of the areas are actually higher than they have been in previous years for year-to-date figure. Um, but pleasing out of that is accidental dwelling fires and casualties from dwelling fires are actually um, reducing. They are quite low levels and I'll be quite honest with you, I'm not too sure how much further we can go and reduce them. You know that they are very, very small figures at the moment. More concerning to me is the other areas that are going up. But as I explained through the quarterly report, they've not all gone up in this, in this particular quarter. Um, we attended 656 incidents so far this year, which is an increase of 81 incidents in Midlothian itself. I'll go over to page 7, which is all accidental dwelling fires. Um, during the quarter, we responded to only nine accident, uh, accidental dwelling fires, which is, which is a reduction in six incidents from the same reporting period last year. And if you look at the graph at the bottom of the page, or the second up from the bottom of the page, you'll see that we're quite well below the Scottish, the Scottish average and the average for our East Service Delivery Area in terms of um, attending uh, domestic property fires. What we have, nine, nine of the fires, out of the nine of the fires, 80% of them occurred in single occupants of households, and the main causes, are, as we usually have here, are cooking and smoking. Um, so it's quite clear to see that we continue to target single occupants of households. This is where we're having our fires. Um, and the more, the more referrals we get from partners on the, high, on the more vulnerable people within our uh, community, we'll be able to target these premises a lot, lot better. But certainly single occupants of households are a risk within Midlothian area. As it is, it's a common picture across Scotland. It's not just here for Midlothian. But Partners, we do know the vulnerable people in our society, and we can go out there and carry out some home safety visits, etc., to continue to reduce this number, although it is very low as it stands. Some of the actions we've taken, we've done 213 home safety visits over the period, fitted 101 smoke detectors, and 77 of those visits were carried out in what we deem as high-risk premises, so people who are, lived alone, who had uh, alcohol, uh, drug problems, smokers, etc., a range of other things. So they were 77 of them in high risk. I would like to see that figure, as I always say here, and I would like to see that figure increasing so that the majority of house visits that we carry out are in high risk properties. That will help us make Midlothian safer. So we'll continue to work on that with partners. Um, page 9. Accidental dwelling fire casualties, fatal and non-fatal. Non there were no fatal casualties during this reporting period, and we only dealt with two other casualties during this time, which is the same as it was last year. We're in line with the rest of Scotland at the moment, um, as far as casualties are concerned. And what I will say, and I've said for the last two or three uh, quarterly reports, is that the majority of our casualties now the good thing about having smoke detectors is they're not attending hospital. The two casualties that, or the two casualties that had fires were attended to at the scene. They both had working smoke detectors, which got them out of the house quickly, and we gave them oxygen at the scene, which prevented them going to hospital. 
Again, we'll continue to work on this, um, and spit and smoke detectors will help us reduce, maybe not reduce fires, but reduce the, the impact of people having a fire in terms of further care through the NHS, etc. Page 11, all deliberate fires, this is excluding dwellings. We attended 69 deliberate fires during this period, which is a decrease of eight in the same period last year. 70% of these incidents were deliberate secondary fires. 27% um, of that involved refuse bins, 47% waste or scrub land, 15% be understanding crop, and 5% were outdoor structures, um, such as sheds and garages, and 6% of these were vehicles. Um, although it has decreased in this quarter, we have seen an increase over the year to date from the figures I showed you earlier. There has been an increase in year to date. And like Kenny mentioned, a lot of this is around antisocial behaviour. You know, th there tends to be, if you get a little spike in antisocial behaviour in an area, you get an increase in deliberate secondary fires in, in those same areas. And we've been working with uh, information from the weekly TAC through the data analyst to continue to look at where these hotspots are and continue with partners to take action on these. And that will always continue. And we do try through using our community safety campaign calendar and the evidence to target areas before things happen. But with having the TAC, you can also do it after the event. You can start targeting areas if you get a little spike. So we work, so we work from both sides. Sometimes the actual preventative action doesn't work. You may get a little bout of hot weather, a little problem in an area, and it, and it, you get a little spike. But we, we don't ignore that. We continue to work there as well. Page 13. Um, we always report on RTCs. We attended 16 RTCs during this period, which is an increase in three for us. And as you see from the graph, second from bot bottom we are above the Scottish average and the East Service delivery area average. Um, we only report the, the police... Uh, colleagues in the police report on the actual figures and we only report on the ones that we were called to. Um, but we are above the average for Scotland. Okay, I'm now going on to page 15. So that's special service casualties. Um, that's for all the special services we attend as well as road traffic collisions. Um, we attended the 16 casualties we attended during this quarter, uh, two of which were fatalities. That's an increase of seven casualties compared to the same period last year. So out of the casualties we attended to, seven injuries and one fatality were recorded at road traffic collisions. Five other casualties um, and one fatality were recorded at what we class now as medical emergencies, going out with the ambulance service or going out on our own to out of, hosti out of, hospital, out of hospital cardiac arrest. Midlothian aren't actually being used. There's a pilot running across Scotland, and Midlothian aren't involved in the pilot. But what we're finding is that as the pilot starts, as, the pi as more people start to hear about the pilot, and we have got defibrillators on fire engines, we have been called out on occasions to deal with medical responses, as well as dealing with bariatrics um, in their home who have fallen and things. So. I have said in the past that I would imagine this figure will increase and we're already seeing half of it used to just be predominantly road traffic collision casualties that we dealt with. However, we're now almost 50-50 medical response versus RTs in road traffic collisions. I can see that number increasing as we go along. Again, we're slightly above um, the Scottish average on that and that's maybe just because we are responding and we have been for some time in Midlothian working with the, um, the Falls team for bariatric people in their house. So maybe that's why we're just above. And the last area is the unwanted fire alarm signals. We attended 80 unwanted fire alarm signals, which is an increase of 28, um, which is quite a big jump for the area. But pleasing for us is that we're, we're a wee bit below the Scottish average as far as unwanted fire alarm signals are concerned. Um, we are... Every unwanted fire alarm signal gets looked at and we certainly look at repeat offenders and at the moment we're working with three different repeat offending premises in Midlothian 
working with their management teams to ensure that, that the amount of unwanted fire alarm signals that come to us reduce. And a lot of times it is just about managing these things. But what we are finding is that for everyone that we manage and we help the management reduce, there's another new premises coming on board with a new fire alarm system or a new business being set up, or, which is really great for the economy if we're setting up new businesses. However, they get a new fire alarm system, have glitches with it, and they then become an offender to us. So for everyone that we fix, there's another one coming along that gives us some issues. But our fire safety enforcement officers are going out there and doing a really good job to try and keep those, those down. And it's nice that they're below the Scottish average at the moment. Um, appendix 1, which is, I don't think there's any pages on this, so if you move along to where it says prevention and protection activities, Appendix 1. The first page on that, fire safety enforcement audits, that's just to show you that we're still, we're still active in, the, um, in our businesses to make sure that our businesses in Mid Lothian are safe for the people who use them. The next page, home fire safety visits, that's just to let you know that we continue to look at our home safety visits and we have a target, a ta the blue line through the middle, if you've got a blue line, or the straight line through the middle has been, um, that is our Scottish target and in Mid Lothian we're quite a wee bit above that which is very pleasing to me as well. Um, there's a section called community safety engagement, a little graph, that's just to show you that um, we continue to visit schools, visit nurseries, have our cool down in Phoenix programmes which is not bespoke to Mid Lothian but at the moment, moment Mid Lothian are the only area that actually has a Phoenix programme and that's been kept running because of the partnership working arrangements in Mid Lothian um, there's a real desire to keep that programme running as, as often as possible Road safety education, we're involved in that, and we continue to have people from schools going to the risk factory. And the last couple of pages are just on partnership working. When I first came here two and a half years ago, we did do partnership working, but I think we're getting a lot more, a lot smarter at how we're presenting it and how we're actually dealing, it, dealing with it. We're using evidence and we're working with partners to look at the risks within the area. And I'm not going to go through it all. There's a lot of activity there. But I'll touch on a couple of areas. It's the third paragraph from the bottom, just to, to let you know that as we keep expanding the knowledge of our, our CAT teams, um, they've just had dementia uh, training um, for, all our, for all our CAT teams, which really helps us to, to understand when they're going in to do home safety visits, etc., and enhanced home safety visits, how they deal with people who have dementia issues and what we can actually do to help. When we're in people's houses, rather than just look at fire, we're starting to look at falls in the home, we're starting to look at their mental health, we're starting to... So our teams to be able to understand that need to be trained. Um, and through Midlothian, we're getting quite a lot of training, so we're, we're becoming a lot more professional when we go into these people's houses. And the last area, I've not actually put it on the list, but it was just to let you know that as far as road safety is concerned, I don't know if you've seen it, but we'd run a, um, an advertisement campaign when the Rugby World Cup was on. With I don't know if anybody's seen it on the TV. Um, with Stuart Hogg, the rugby player that plays for Scotland, on the consequence of um, driving on rural roads. Um, and it was just to let you know that we had run that. And I think there is intention to continue to do that at certain periods over the, over the time. It's a very good advert. Um, and that's all I've got to say. I'll take any questions. Right. Okay, thank you for that report. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a very good report, and I'm very pleased, particularly at the preventative work that you've been doing that each time you come forward to these meetings. Uh, I think it's um, very inspirational and presumably paying dividends. Uh, and it's on that aspect of it, I'd just like to ask a, a, a brief question. Um, my own mother has got dementia at the moment and came very close to <laughs> blowing the house up a few weeks ago and she left the gas on. So it's this kind of thing that uh, I think you were perhaps referring to before when you said that single occupancy homes are the ones where there's the risk and I imagine it's because uh, a large number of those uh, homes will, will house older people who maybe have not just mental health 
issues like dementia, but also physical ones as well. I'm just wondering what sort of work you do with, for example, Alzheimer's Society, social work department, so that they can forewarn you and say, look, can you go and give this house a check over and the particular aspects of a, an individual who lives there that we'd like you, you to look at? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, have, we have done um, a lot of work with Midlothian, the social work um, department in Midlothian. In fact, I think um, we've been out training um, social workers, front-facing social workers, what to look for in people's houses as far as fire safety is concerned. It's okay for us walking in. We can see exactly what we think is right and wrong. But a social worker going in just thinking about doing their job may not always look for that. Um, so we've done a lot of training and we, start, we are starting to get what we call referrals through our community safety engagement tool uh, from partner agencies, which is really good. Uh, as far as um, dementia awareness, all our CAT teams are having training on this and our frontline staff, that there's a package being, delivered, uh, being developed for our frontline staff as well. Um, but what we also need, and what th this is the area that I need to continue to work on, and we have been working on with the uh, health partners, is knowing that information firsthand. Is, is if someone is being released from hospital or, or, or a doctor's in somewhere, it would be good for us to have that information and get the person to agree to a home safety visit. We can come out and have a look at the place and say, right, what can we do? I, I, I'll give you an example. We, we attended... Um, house fire not that long ago and it was a 83 year old living on brothers 83 year old living downstairs and a 79 year old living upstairs and the 79 year old upstairs had mental health issues and mobility issues but he stayed upstairs the 79 year old the 83 year old older brother made all the decisions he had dementia he'd done all the cooking and um, so we got turned out to they also had a chip pan which he would never have had had to be had a visit. Um, he forgot he had put his chips on, which is similar to what you were saying. He forgot they had put the chips on. Had the house fire. He, dropped, he tried to move the, the, the burning fat, dropped it and burnt all his face. Burnt his, so, so as a result from that, you know, he was in hospital for four months. I think I possibly touched on this before, but we could have, we could have potentially prevented that situation by having been in there earlier. Now, he was known to other partners, so it's getting that information from partners is an important thing to us. Now, we know there's barriers to that. There's barriers between the databases. There's barriers between releasing information. We're trying to work on that and make it better. We are getting there with social work, but we need to keep that journey with, um, with health. And I would love for every older person coming out of hospital who live on their own for us to be involved in their placement back in, and back at home. You know? um, so we are getting there. And... There's national discussions going on just now. Locally, we can only do what we can do. Um, but nationally, I'm, I'm hopeful in the coming future we'll be doing that. Because not only can we do fire safety, we can do home safety about them. I mean, falls in the home are much higher occurrence than, than fires in the home. So, so we, we can help assist with that as well. If I, sorry, if I can just add to that, we are working um, myself and Dean are having a meeting with Health and Social Care to see how we can use capacity within the organisation to address other risks that community faces. Slips, trips and falls is a really good point. We, we're working with, within the, the area. We have a community safety officer, officer responsible for community safety. We're looking to enhance our home fire safety checks, so they'll include um, the, the crews who go in, being able to look at the house from the perspective of falls and they'll be able to provide some um, adaptations, some very minor adaptations for the person living in that home that could improve safety from a false perspective and also for young people, because we're finding that within the community, those are two over 65s, over 75s, and under fives are those most at risk from unintentional harm. So we are taking steps to improve that safety. Okay, I mean, I would, uh, I would like to see extended to any old person coming to hospital, even if it's a couple, because uh, the, the one that's not being hospital may be uh, suffering from dementia as well, so it would be maybe worthwhile extending that one. Uh, as for the falls, that we do have uh, gadgets that, that, that could be given, so if, if you do recognise these things, you pass them on to social work, so the social, social work can go in and advise them to take these bracelets and uh, pull switches and everything else. 
It's for the uh, smoke detectors and things like that. And I think, I don't know if you, you, you do this, in your, but when you do suggest it to uh, people, I was in a wholesaler the other day, and this uh, chap was buying a smoke detector. But he was concerned that it still included a battery, and he was looking for one that didn't have a battery. And the, the, the person serving him was saying, yeah, I'm, I've been trying to get these things as well. And I had to explain to them, I say, that the battery is there for safety backup in case of a power failure. And I don't know if you explain that to the people when you install these uh, things. You do. Do you also put in the carbon monoxide detectors rather than just smoke detectors? That term that the, the battery is there for a purpose, but obviously, if you don't, if you don't install the 240 volt with a battery backup, then it, uh, you'll be explaining that to anybody. It's a 10, 10 year battery in the, the detector, anyway. Yeah, and they do explain it because sometimes Thanks, just, just briefly, just having uh, uh, had bonfire night last week, I was involved in organising a bonfire in my local community, and I also was last time it was held, which is about 30 years ago, and it struck me the difference. Then we piled all the wood up, set the fire to it, and people were standing quite close. This time we went to the insurance people, they said they gave us quite strict instructions, and we got council barriers put up and, and that. And it just struck me how safer it is now. And I don't think it detracted at all from the occasion, having barriers there, because people could go quite close up to it and know they were safe. Uh, the insurance company said we were not allowed fireworks, but they gave us a price for insurance for next year, and it was amazingly small. It was something like about £50 if you've only got up to 400 people, and it goes up from then. And I thought this was why the bonfire stopped about 30 years ago, because we found the insurance costs were just too high. And I'm just wondering whether the experience of introducing these safety measures has meant that the number of incidents have, has gone down uh, for, for organised events like that over the years, and therefore the insurance companies have picked up on this and said that provided you put these measures in place, then we're happy that it's going to be safe. Has that been your experience that the incidents at organised events like firework displays and bonfires has gone down quite sharply over the last 30 years? Yes, um, absolutely. I was just talking about that with the, the, the watch at Dalkeith before we came out. and I think they were only called, um, they were working that night, and they were only called to two bonfires, two bonfire incidents that night. Now, going back even 10 years ago, that would have been in the 50s, 60s, easily. Yes, in fact, yeah, they would have been out the whole night. So what, what we have done, you know, Sometimes I think we're victims of our own success, particularly with the um, reduction of house fires, etc. Everything's going down. You sometimes think, oh, is there going to be anything left for us to do? <laughs> um, and it's the same with bonfires. We have worked tirelessly over the years with partners um, to, to make this safer. And I think what's come from that is the community held events. And that has really, really worked. Whereas before every little area used to have a bonfire, they started saying, no, we'll put it together. And the, the councils fund the events. Um, a lot of the times, a lot of times, it's community, smaller community councils will fund them. So they bring the community together in a safe environment. Nobody can run through the bonfire. If they're having fireworks, it's safe. And there's very, very few accidents. And that's probably why the insurance costs are so low, because no one can get anywhere near it. And you tend to find that the fireworks are done by an organised company. Um, and also, I mean, we had two, we had police officers sitting in, um, in Dalkeith Fire Station, just in, you know, just in case, because at one stage there were times when you'd go to a fire and you would end up 
throwing bricks at you or throwing sticks at you or trying to hit you and things like that. And that is that is completely gone to, over the last few years. And, and it's testament to all the work that multi-agency approach has done. Mm. And I've actually, we've had people out in cars with police sergeants going round assessing bonfires and saying, yeah, you've got adults here. It's not, it's not near a building. It's not near overhead wires. You've got adults here. Yeah, keep it burning as long as you're going to stay here. And that whole... We used to just turn up and put it out, and then there would be a big fight. But, <laughs> but, but now we're a wee bit. It's taken us a long time to get smarter, but we're a lot smarter now. So. Okay. Uh, thank you for that report. We move to item number eight, the community payback order and annual report. This is from Hi. Barbara. Hi. Thanks. I'll speak to this. Uh, this is uh, the annual report that the Scottish Government um, requires every year regarding community payback orders and um, community payback orders were introduced in 2011 and replaced um, what had been the previous court orders which were basically probation and community service orders. Um, this is a national template. As you'll see, the template is very focused towards unpaid work, although I would say that one of the things in relation to what Dean's just been saying was that unpaid work um, went round and picked up a lot of rubbish prior to bonfire night that could have otherwise been set alight. So um, had a contribution to that. Very successful night. Um, so the first part describes the, the different types of unpaid work projects that um, Midlothian has been uh, involved in over 2014-15. As you can see, there's a, a really wide variety of different types of projects, um, some of them very innovative, such as building a a garden for a um, children's charity out of completely recycled material, which meant that the, the charity um, didn't have to pay anything at all. Normally what happens is that the beneficiaries pay for the materials and obviously all the labour is done by unpaid work, but in this case there was no cost for materials um, either and it was a very successful project that the Scottish Government Chief Social Work Advisor visited a couple of weeks ago um, and was very impressed. So there's lots of... Um, descriptions of different types of unpaid work activities. There's then some descriptions of the other activity. When community payback orders came in, um, part of the legislation was that 30 hours or 30 per cent, whichever is greater, of um, unpaid work hours can be used for an other activity. And that other activity is something that would um, help the person um, that's the subject of the order not to re-offend. Other than that, it's a very, very wide range of different things. So, for instance, we've got the Rural Skills Taster course with New Battle Abbey, which runs for a 30-hour period. Um, it's been a really big success. Lots of people who've done that Taster course have gone on to actually commit, um, commit to the full college course and um, have got qualifications out of it in Rural Skills. We've got Spring for Women Offenders, which um, is not just for offenders, but for any woman who's got kind of multiple and complex needs that could lead her into offending. Um, that can also be used as other activity. But as I say, you don't have to be involved in criminal justice to access Spring. Um, and I'm not going to read them all out, but I would advise you that it's quite an interesting read if you want to have a look. Um, we've also got a range of feedback um, in this report feedback from beneficiaries, all beneficiaries of unpaid work and ask for their comments and there's also feedback from service users about how they feel the, um, what was the impact on them and on their likelihood of reoffending of their community payback orders um, there's then on page 64 a description of consultation activities we've got an interactive facility on the Midlothian Council website which means that people can suggest unpaid work, make comments about it ask any questions um, and what we tend to find is that if there's a kind of public, um, if, if there's anything publicly um, said about unpaid work, that increases. So I think it's partly about just sparking it off because I think it kind of tends to kind of die down the activity on the website, but then it'll increase if there's other publicity, for instance, in the local newspaper or whatever. Um, so on page 65, you can see there was 233 CPOs made in 2014 altogether. 185 of them were um, included unpaid work and 121 were only unpaid work um, with 44 only um, supervision but then unpaid work and supervision were 68 so it was over 100 orders with supervision supervision equates to what used to be probation orders um, and 
I suppose that's the bit that feels slightly unbalanced about the template in the sense that all the criminal justice social workers are working with people who are on supervision or coming out of prison supervision, but this is obviously CPOs, in terms of working with people to change their behaviour. And it kind of feels like there's a slight um, imbalance in the report because um, criminal justice social workers are not involved in unpaid work. That's separate unpaid work staff that are part of the same team. So the next bit of the report talks about those supervision requirements in relation to CPOs. It talks a bit about our work with domestic abuse. We run Caledonian here, which um, doesn't just work with the perpetrators, but also supports the women and children affected by domestic abuse. It says a bit more about spring in terms of our women offenders. Um, it says a bit about sexual offending in relation to the Moving Forward Making Changes programme, which is an accredited programme that runs throughout Scotland. Um, in relation to sexual offending and then says a bit about general offending and all the different partners that, that community payback and the criminal justice team works with to help people to um, reduce their likelihood of reoffending and there's a, there's a lot of partners there. Um, so that is basically the report. I would certainly say to read it, I, th I mean I think there could be a lack of um, knowledge sometimes about what criminal justice social work actually does and it's quite a good example of um, all the different activities that went on within criminal justice social work in the last year. But I suppose the main thing really is that this is the first meeting of the, not just the shadow, not just the, reducing, the Safety, Safer Communities Board, but the Reducing Reoffending Partnership. And I think the whole point really of that is that criminal justice social work alone can't reduce reoffending. We had a really successful event last Friday um, in relation to the transition to the new structure for community justice in Scotland and I think the main um, challenge for us really over the next year is to consolidate the partners that we've got in relation to reducing reoffending and also create some new ones as well. I think we're quite well off here, I think we've got some very good partnership uh, relationships already um, but I think we need to, as I say, consolidate these and bring more people on board and actually more people around this table as we go forward um, towards the new structure for community justice in Scotland and the next there will be the next but one I think item on the agenda is a transition plan towards that new structure which has been prepared by Steve across the table from me so thanks very much any questions or comments on that report okay no, I have to agree with you Margaret with the, the event last Friday it was uh, it was very very good item number Nine, uh, Community Safety Performance Report by right, Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the half-year report on the Community Planning Partnership's thematic for community safety. The summary page uh, in 71 of your papers um, really covers most of the points that have been uh, addressed by partners here this morning relative to housebreaking, road safety, um, the spring project, which Margaret recently referenced, um, so I, I wouldn't want to rehearse all of those because you, you've had those from the partners directly and indeed it is a compilation of the partnership working and the measures behind the summary page again are reflected within the individual reports that you've had from those uh, source agencies and happy to take any questions that members may have on that or otherwise it's for noting at this stage. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Chair. It's just really uh, on antisocial behaviour. I must say, I don't know if my uh, councillor colleagues would agree with this, but I, I find it the most difficult issue to face. When people contact me and say they've got a neighbour who's causing problems or whatever, I can refer it to officials and they can deal with it as, prof with it as professionals, but I, I feel powerless. I say to people, look, can you get as much information as you can, try and get evidence, try not to be seen taking photographs, etc., and give them advice like that. But apart from that, they must go away thinking, well, what's he done? And I'm not quite sure what I can do. Do you have any advice in that respect? No, that's precisely what I would ask you to do, is to, to have those individuals um, contact ourselves directly as the community safety team. And uh, obviously, again, as has been demonstrated this morning, we would work with partners relative to whatever the particular circumstances were. Um, and again, we're not expecting neighbours to necessarily put themselves in that position where they'll experience aggravation. We've got a range of uh, kit that can be carried 
uh, out uh, and surveillance that can be carried out through officers. So in that respect, we are the professional witnesses, whether it's ourselves, police or fire. So people who appreciate have to live in those circumstances are not being subjected to further aggravation uh, or harassment, depending on the nature of the, the issue. Um, we've had other circumstances where the telecare has been deployed. The province mentioned that in respect of older people, and we're able to deploy that within the community safety team, because we can then hear what's actually going on at the time it's going on, when that's reported in. Um, so it's, it's being more creative and clever about using some of the, the toys that are available to us um, in different services that wouldn't otherwise be used that way. Uh, but no, that's precisely the advice you're giving is the right one so that we can then make that assessment about how we can best resolve that. Uh, and sometimes it's just an awareness. Some people who live in flatted accommodation are aware of uh, the impact they're having on their neighbours. And that early intervention helps. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and that's where we escalate that through enforcement and, again, collectively, as is referenced here between the antisocial behaviour team, the ASBO group. So we're working in conjunction with any police action and relating that to a tenancy action at the same time. So there is that collective enforcement that goes on. Councillor Barry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Kevin, I just wanted to ask on page four for the uh, indicator uh, to increase awareness of violence against women. I know that that target is not met and I'm assuming that that's down to the vacancy issue um, that's further explained. But what I did want to clarify was the indicator itself is a number of violence against women training events taking place. Um, it, just, it tends to be in my experience that people who go along to training events are already aware um, of the issues and, and tend to attract uh, like-minded people. So I just wondered what other events uh, could tie into awareness and whether we're uh, targeting uh, young people. I'm just quite aware of the, the very recent uh, social attitude survey for young people and particularly how um, young school children um, thought that a lot of those behaviours were acceptable, which is quite concerning. So I just wondered if that's in the strategy at all. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. In terms of your first point, that's correct. There's, we were running with a vacancy for some time. That's su subsequently been addressed uh, through the course of this year. Uh, certainly in terms of the training events, I take the point, absolutely. Um, it, it can be that we're speaking to the converted on occasion, but really it's tapping into what's available to us and deploying that, like the White Ribbon campaign, um, to staff specifically. Again, rehearsing some of the points, it's the staff who are at the front line who are in people's homes for whatever reason, having that awareness and acknowledgement, and generally they do, but sometimes we just need to be refreshed and reminded of that. Um, so that's certainly what's happened to date. Equally, as you say, it's taken account of opportunities which we're coming on to in the next report with the Midfest uh, and the Community Safety Village opportunity there, and we did get some good feedback uh, in regard to that. And as you say, targeting that we have um, developed an educational pack for the schools, Community Safety Team and indeed the Homeless Team get into schools as part of the social element of the Curriculum for Excellence, um, and we take that opportunity to plug as many messages, and this is one of those in that regard, particularly, as you say, taking account of uh, uh, the, the survey results in, in recent weeks uh, against the background of a whole range of work that's gone on, because we're all well aware of the prevalence in this area uh, of domestic violence, and that's been referenced again earlier this morning. Um, it's a, just an ongoing task that we need and are continuing to, to plug away at. Okay. Yes. Certainly in terms of the first question, Fiona, yes is the short answer. Uh, there's work that's ongoing and in terms of the additional capacity which the Scottish Government funding has given us for the analysis post, which is currently in recruitment, uh, will allow us to align those measures. Um, and I think this report reflects that. It's a compilation of what's there already uh, and it's making best use of that. Uh, so yes was the answer to that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the off-target measures, Absolutely, um, we're conscious that work 
needs to continue there. There has been the whole systems approach in terms of youth justice um, that we've been uh, attempting to address here. Again, that's work that's ongoing. There has been um, some pause in that relative to service reviews, which have been going on within the, the host services, but we're conscious of the impact that's had as a consequence across um, ourselves as partners in, in doing the day job. Um, and all the, and having addressed that with the service concerned, yes, it's whether that best sits within this agenda as opposed to children, services and, and young people. Um, and we haven't quite concluded that debate, to my knowledge, uh, but it's one that we're conscious of uh, and we'll need to report in due course here or indeed the GERFEC board relative to the appropriate thematic for the community planning partners. We're conscious there's a gap there um, and we were working to address that uh, and we'll continue to do that once it's determined which is the most appropriate structure in which to do that, whether it's this um, collective forum or the GERFEC uh, board. Okay, thank you. Um, we're on to uh, item number 10, Safer Communities in Shadow Reducing Rural Offending Partnership Priorities for 2016-2017. Are you taking this again, Kevin? Thank you. Yep, thank you, Chair. Uh, this paper reflects on work that's been done by a number of people in the room um, in recent weeks following on from the Community Planning Partnership Day. Obviously, we were reflecting, and indeed this report reflects on the priorities for 15-16. Uh, and then it details the uh, process for priority setting in section 2.3 of that report um, in terms of what, uh, what was populated through the, the matrix process on evidence, the scale, the impact and the seriousness from a range of sources, including the citizens panel from the household survey, um, as well as um, partners di directly in terms of trend analysis uh, and the current practice. So from that, the group uh, followed the uh, community safety priority recommendations for 1617, uh, and those are detailed in 2.2 and tabulated there relative to the priority, uh, the background to that, and the recommendation of the uh, level of that category. And that resulted on page 92 of your papers in terms of the recommended priorities from a further session after the CPP day, which was uh, a week ago, and the uh, ranking of the outcomes for the priorities for 16 and 17, with the, uh, these were classed into high priorities, priorities uh, otherwise, and then cross-cutting ones, which are essentially part of business as usual for uh, what the partnership does in feeling safe and community involvement, so that that's an ongoing process rather than just reliant on feedback when we, we undertake this exercise uh, on an annual basis. So from that uh, priority setting process, what that means in terms of the high priorities at the top of the table is that they will receive concentrated effort and resources um, in addition to that which is ascribed to the other priorities within the table. And it's recommended that the uh, board today approve those recommended priorities and remit the delivery group to develop the strategy and the action plan for the delivery of those in the forthcoming year. Thank you. Okay, any questions or comments on that report? Are we happy to approve the recommendation of the priorities in this report? Okay, thank you. Item number 11, um, Safer Communities and Shadow Reducing Reoffending Board. Uh, again, uh, you, Kevin, thank you. Thanks, Chair. This is uh, for members' information. Uh, I think it's been circulated previously to elected members. Uh, it's in, been issued under the name of Councillor Constable as the Chair of the Licensing Board and reflects that we are engaging in a review of the over-provisioning statement uh, so there's further consultation exercise which is ongoing. That commenced a few weeks ago and is due to conclude on the 26th of November. So it's simply just for members to, to note and be aware. Is it so noted? Thank you. Item number 12, Community Safety Partnership, Community Safety Village, mid phase 2015 and evaluation report. A report by Magna Clark. I'll take uh, that, Chair. This well, okay. <laughs> is an uh, evaluation report submitted for uh, members' interest. 
Uh, as we've referenced earlier, there was the Community Safety Village event which took place during Midfest on the 13th of September. Uh, and this was placed in the Family Fun Day. We had an uh, attendance of approximately 6,000 people that day. And the, this was a, a particularly busy week. We'd had the railway opening, and there was also the Doors Open Day event over that weekend. Uh, the Community Safety Partnership had planned activities over this weekend, and the feedback from that is what's compiled in the, the report. The resourcing of the event was from partner agencies. Uh, there was also resource which was allocated in terms of funding through the Awards for All to allow us to uh, purchase some of the, the, the equipment and freebies which could be uh, issued out. Uh, the staff volunteered in terms of their participation and we'd asked for feedback from them in terms of the event itself and also customer survey results from those who attended which are detailed at section 4.3 about the activities and the information that was gained as a result of uh, people's attendance at the village within the Midfest day itself. There's an evaluation summary from section 5 and the appendices about those participating uh, agencies and partners is also appended to the report and this will assist ourselves in terms of future planning if this is uh, replicated again next year in terms of the same event uh, and is otherwise for members to, to note the contents, Chair. Colleagues happy to note this. Report, Councillor Baxter. We were just wondering who got the massages. <laughs> Do we have that information? I wasn't attending. I'm not <laughs> able to give further detail, sorry. Well, we'll never know now. Item number 13, Midlothian Community Planning Partnership, Draft Community Justice tra Transitional Plan for 2016-17. Again, I'm accepting your take of this, Kevin. Thank yes, you. thank you, Chair. This is a um, significant piece of work which has been referenced through the morning in terms of the Draft Community Justice Transitional Plan for Midlothian. Um, as a number of members will be aware, because they, they were there, we had the workshop event on Friday, which was well received uh, and fully engaged in. Uh, and indeed, the uh, plan, it was comforting to, to know, having read it again over the weekend, contains a lot of the, the feedback from partners and agencies who are engaged in the, the process uh, for the uh, re reducing reoffending agenda. Obviously, members are aware in terms of uh, preceding meetings that the community justice authorities are due to be disestablished and that the remit of this group has been extended to take account of the reducing reoffending uh, partnership as well as uh, uh, community safety itself. And the membership has been changed to reflect that, um, which is detailed on page 118 of your papers for the expanded role and membership of this board. In terms of our partnership responsibilities, they're detailed at section 3.2 in terms of the guidance which has been issued out from Scottish Government in preparation for the transition. Uh, the local offending profile uh, role, um, the work on that is commenced and will continue with the additional resource that we're currently recruiting as referenced earlier. There is a strategic uh, delivery plan for community justice. That's detailed at appendix two in your papers. Uh, and my colleagues Margaret Brew and Steve Cairns are here to assist and speak to that because uh, they've also been involved in the development of that. And the annual reporting framework uh, will be uh, undertaken towards the end of the transition year to pick up an earlier question uh, in terms of the performance framework and, and outcomes to be evidenced from that. There's an update in terms of the national position in section four because we're being led clearly in terms of the uh, Community Justice Scotland expectations, which will have be the uh, overriding oversight body uh, in terms of strategic actions and the planning uh, for this uh, transition period. In terms of ourselves locally at 4.4 from the Community Justice Bill being introduced in May of this year, this I think is the third paper we've brought to the board just to plot the progress as uh, we move towards full implementation. From the uh, initial granting of 50,000 from Scottish Government to the C Community Justice Transitional Fund, we've employed the partnership officer, Steve, who's with us today, uh, and there are uh, additional 
actions relative to the fund for the recruitment of an analyst who will assist in the reducing the offending profile and equally some of the outcome measures. The timeline in terms of that is also attached in terms of our progress towards full compliance and at this stage we are reassured that, that we are on uh, the respective timeline for that and attached is, as I say, the draft transitional plan, noting that it is a draft but has taken account, as I say, of the uh, contributions from members and partners, including those from the event on Friday and the communications plan relative to stakeholders and the community at large is also appended to this report for noting and indeed any questions from members, Chair. Any questions or comments? Just very briefly to say the workshop last Friday was uh, well attended and I felt uh, of great value. It was uh, really appreciated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just um, a final point up to you have been asked by Councillor De Vink to raise his again his concerns that the Labour group have failed to turn up uh, for this meeting. Can I do that now? Okay. Right. Um, well thank you all for attending. Uh, and good afternoon.